Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are studying the mind of Christ, thinking like Jesus. In this session, we'll be looking at Matthew 22 and verse 37, the love of Jesus. Let's look at Matthew, a large, the larger text, Matthew 22, verse 34, down to verse 40, which includes our, our text, verse 37. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Of the five major influence groups among the Jews, the two most prominent were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees accepted only the Torah, the first five books of scripture. They didn't believe in angels and demons or the afterlife. They tried to trip up Jesus by asking questions, a question about the afterlife. The Pharisees were of the middle class. They were conservative in believing all the Old Testament. They tended to be very legalistic. <clears throat> they loved to debate every commandment of God. The Pharisee in this passage was a lawyer, an expert in the law. He probably knew all 613 of them and which ones were considered most important, which is the great commandment. Jesus answered his question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Verse 37. Anytime Jesus says something, it's important. Listen, Jesus is referring to a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. Known as the Shema, which means listen, this verse is the most famous of all Jewish sayings. It exhorts a commitment to God of your total being, every part of your personality without reserve. If you get this right, everything else will fall into place. You'll be motivated to act in a loving way and to be transformed by God into the image of Jesus Christ. But how do we do this? How do we love God? Gary Chapman wrote a book titled The Five Love Languages, written to help husbands and wives understand how to speak each other's love language. He's written Bible studies that relate the five love languages for married couples, children, and teenagers. Then he wrote The Love Languages of God. Let's look at the five languages of the love languages of God as they apply to our relationship with God. First, words of affirmation. God speaks words of affirmation. So many places in the word of God, he affirms us and tells us he loves us and that he'll never leave us. For some, this is the primary way that God's love is experienced. So how can I affirm God? God loves to hear you praise him. He loves to hear you thank him. God loves to hear you speak words of affirmation to others in all the areas of your life. Listen to David speak words of affirmation to the Lord in Psalm 119 and verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Second, uh, quality time. In Love Languages of God, Gary Chapman wrote, quality time is time with each other, giving the other person full attention. For some of you, this is the primary way you experience love from God. Remember the hymn, In the Garden? I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear 
the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. Gary Chapman writes, as soon as you turn your focus on God, God turns his focus on you. And then third, gifts. God is a giver of good gifts. In fact, one of his given names by Abraham in Genesis twenty-two fourteen 14 is Jehovah Jireh, God who provides. James chapter one, verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And then fourth, acts of service. Gary Chapman writes, doing things for people, especially things you know they would like for you to do. Meeting the needs of others who are hurting or helpless or in need are acts of service. Do things in the name of Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. In a previous session, we discussed the servant nature of Jesus when he washed the disciples' feet. The greatest act of service Jesus ever performed as an expression of his love is when he gave his life on the cross to pay the penalty we owed for our sin. Fifth, physical touch. We experience God's physical touch when we feel his presence, holding us up when we're struggling, lifting us up when we've fallen. The Bible is filled with examples of God reaching out to touch his children. His strengthening in Isaiah 40 and verse 31. His protection in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. Think about how Jesus touched Paul personally in his conversion on the Damascus Road. Uh, Acts chapter 9, look at it. In verse 1 down to verse 22. And then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to, his, to the ground and I heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were opened, he saw no, no more. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in the vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. 
And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there, were, there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? And he has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. The Christian life is not lived by us, but by Jesus Christ living it through us. Galatians 2.20 speaks directly to that. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One closing thought from Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. You have a great day.